What are they booing about? I don't know. Well, welcome to the Mindful Cranks. We're using your mind is not necessarily a bad thing. And we're being cranky can actually be mindful. Let's crank it up. Well, well welcome to the Mindful Cranks. Uh, we've been off the air for, for a while. Uh, quite a busy year, quite a busy summer. I'm Ron Purser at San Francisco State. And my colleague over in Brooklyn, mm-hmm. David Forbes over in Brooklyn. Are you there, David? Brooklyn is in the house. <laughs> and we have a guest today that we're very excited about uh, interviewing, uh, Dr. Funi Su. Uh, we've been following her work for three or four years now. And Funi is uh, an assistant professor of American Studies in the Humanities Department at San Jose State University. Welcome, Funi. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited and honored. Yes, we've been uh, looking forward to this. Um, been following most of your writings over the years, and uh, it's been very, very uh, educational, very provocative, and I think quite a contribution. Uh, mm-hmm. And so maybe uh, we can get started maybe by talking a little bit about uh, your evolution, maybe, uh, in terms of how you got interested in the mindfulness uh, uh, phenomena, but also some of your educational uh, journey, too. Okay. Um, how I got interested in mindfulness? Well, I should start by saying that I was raised in a Buddhist household, um, in a Buddhist culture. I was born in Taiwan. Um, and so that framework is something that I've known since I was very young. Um, and my interest in secular mindfulness and the sudden um, explosive trend in it across many sectors, um, social sectors, has kind of been rooted in the fact that I grew up with this framework and suddenly it's become this thing that people are talking about, this thing that people are practicing and paying a lot of money to participate in. Right. Um, and feeling like that's a very interesting thing to see um, from the perspective of someone who grew up with the shame of being Buddhist in a predominantly Judeo-Christian nation. Um, And it takes me back to someone who was at the Buddhist Peace Fellowship Retreat that we hosted in 2014, who was also um, someone who was raised Buddhist, South Asian. And she said it was quite interesting for her to see all this talk of mindfulness because um, this is something that's been in her community. And And what she realized um, was troubling for her was that there was all this monetary value associated with secular mindfulness and how in her tradition, it's not something that you pay for. It's just something that is practiced communally um, and paid for in terms of respect and generosity and dana. Um, So when she said that, I realized like that's that's what it was. That's what it was. That component that I couldn't identify in words Mm -hmm. Um, was kind of what drew me to studying and observing this secular mindfulness um, kind of boom in American culture. Yeah, and so that seemed like to be a a major trigger for you then, um, this cultural appropriation of uh, Asian Buddhism um, and the uh, the way it's been, uh, well, the erasure. I think you used the term erasure of of the whole tradition of how Asians have have maintained uh, this tradition for twenty six hundred years. But uh, mm-hmm. that's where your writing really gets interesting. I think we'll get into that in a minute. But uh, okay, David, do you uh, uh, have any uh, key questions for Funi in terms of uh, what what has struck you uh, in her writings? Uh, over the years? Um, I'll try again. You know, many of us were, were very struck by Funi's article um, in, that, that really almost went viral in, in the from the Buddhist Peace Fellowship uh, as a response to the New York Times. So anyone that gets to respond to the New York Times is already, uh, not that they published you, but <laughs> it, it certainly was on the Internet. Um, and, and, and you're, you know... From a, from a, I mean, what I've been seeing since then, I mean, that article is, is kind of a secular, from a secular point of view, it's a, it's a, it's a solid critique of, 
of the concerns about how mindfulness is being used in public schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the one of the one of the things that I read before that we can get to that article, but um, you you were wondering why wouldn't meditation? Some, somebody was saying you were quoting somebody that said why why wouldn't meditation necessarily work in certain neighborhoods? In, in mm. And um, maybe you could say more about that. I know you. Um, it, it's true what Ron said. There's a, there's a real interweaving of, of both a kind of a, a very solid uh, critique of neoliberal uh, approaches in schools and and also a very strong uh, very strong Buddhist foundation. Mm. I mean, but you also use Alan Sanaki's term of collective karma. Yeah. Um, if you care care to comment on any of that. Yeah, okay, where to begin? Hmm. Uh, well, I thought, uh, first of all, the component in the article that you mentioned, I think it was from uh, one of the pieces in Turning Wheel from Buddhist Peace Fellowship, um, where I was referencing an East Bay Express article on, uh, I think it was called like Life and Death and PTSD in Oakland. It was a fantastic piece, fantastic. Um, but there was someone who I believe was a school school administrator, someone working within OUSD, um, was mentioning that they try mindfulness, and uh, for some students it's been helpful, but it's not something that can necessarily be a panacea for all students and all the social ills in Oakland in regards to uh, the PTSD that many of the students carry with them. And I thought that that was such an honest thing to say, um, and... It spoke to many of the complexities around not just secular mindfulness in schools, but the layers of the issues that are interwoven in it, um, particularly race and um, economics and this history of American empire. Um, so mm -hmm. it, to me, it was a very useful quote to kind of pull up and kind of highlight um, in regards to some of the issues that I was talking about, which were those things that I mentioned, race, neoliberalism, colonialism, uh, what's been happening in, in Oakland and different areas in the United States um, for many generations and how we can understand it and how in regards to um, people who look at schools and try to reform schools, how we've delusioned ourselves to seeking certain types of reforms on a very superficial and surface level. Yeah. I think that brings up... Uh... <clears throat> I, I can't resist, so I'm going to have to bring it up. Uh, but uh, uh, your chapter in our handbook, uh, the Handbook of Mindfulness, that just came out, uh, Culture, Context, and Social Engagement, uh, your chapter uh, is a beautiful title. Uh, what is the sound of one invisible hand clapping? Neoliberalism, the invisibility of Asian and Asian-American Buddhist and secular mindfulness in education. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, that pops out immediately in the chapter is is your uh, claim that uh, secular mindfulness is uh, entrenched in uh, basically uh, white supremacy. I know yeah. that's a very strong statement, but on the other hand, uh, I think you've laid out very clearly in this chapter uh, the processes that have occurred to make that happen. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe you would like to expand a little bit. Um, maybe, you know, one of the points I think you make really strongly is when you bring up the connection between uh, MBSR and secular mindfulness and how science has been used uh, mm -hmm. as a way uh, to uh, appropriate uh, mindfulness. But, but I think there's something much stronger in what you're saying than that, this whole universalizing tendency yeah, and and yeah. The, the effect that has uh, on erasure of of historicity. Can you say a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so specifically in regard to that, the last point about race um, and this scientification of secular mindfulness through MBSR, um, it really harkens from a lot of the research that's been done um, in kind of the fields of ethnic studies and. Um, uh, colonialism, critical colonial studies that looks at how um, non-white cultures, uh, the cultures of the globe that have been suppressed through histories of imperial projects have kind of been reduced to 
reduced to um, being understood as something that's delegitimate, being reduced to types of knowledges that have been traditionally um, described as barbaric, um, heathen. Right, um, antiquated, superstitious. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Anything that, that departs from white enlightenment rationality. Foreign, um, exotic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, all of that, all, all of that. Non-scientific, too. What's that? And non, non-scientific. Yeah, non-scientific. Um, so there's a way in which these knowledge traditions, which can be seen as very scientific, um, encompasses cosmology of how we understand the world, um, as broad as how we understand the world, to how we understand and should um, interact with each other on a human level, are completely dismissed as something that's invalid. Um, and products of something from the distant path, um, past. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So right. mindfulness then, secular mindfulness in that context, um, the way that it's emerged in the United States and the way that it's been practiced and advocated for in schools, completely disregards this very important context, the context of um, this colonial erasure that has happened to many cultures and to many knowledge traditions and, and kind of picks and chooses the elements that fit within the neoliberal paradigm. And, and I take great issue with that. Yeah, I, 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 I like uh, this chapter so much that there's so much in here. I really recommend it to anyone who wants to go deeper. But I think what you're pointing to is that this phenomena, uh, this imperialist, uh, oppressive, uh, colonialist uh, uh, phenomena is is uh, goes way beyond mindfulness. I mean, it's it, this. I mean, we've been critiquing mindfulness for its uh, for many for many for many angles, but um, in terms of its erasure of uh, its cultural context, uh, is a much deeper phenomena, right? I mean, it, this has happened in many spheres, not just in the mindfulness sphere. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes me think of the work Linda, of uh, Linda Tui Smith on decolonizing methodologies, and and she talks about this history um, as it as it's applied to New Zealand um, and the way that cultures there have been delegitimized, um, and and these types of cultures and knowledge traditions only seem to find way back into the mainstream or validation. Um, in mainstream culture when there's something of it that can be parceled out and be made into a product. And I see that happening with mindfulness. Yeah. yeah. I I just want to add that that, that I I just thought it was a a terrific um, enrichment of of kind of some of the critiques. I mean, I'm I'm one of those who's been concerned about, about, and, and I know you talk about this too, how uh, mindfulness mystifies the structure of, of social oppression, mm-hmm. and and in terms of neoliberals, in other words, it focuses on the individual. But then you've added this other dimension, where you've really brought in the, the whole notion of of colonialism and and, and the way they've exploited um, Asian cultures and, and and so on. It's just, uh, I mean, I think I think I think you know we have to we we we. It's like you know we let it out of the. Once it's out there, I mean, it's it's we have to include that. We have to we have to always make those points. It's, it's people that if people ignore that, they're they're being irresponsible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, one of the definitions that I've been using quite frequently in different types of writing that I've done is um, David Harvey's work on on neoliberalism, his definition, and how um, well what I appreciate. About, what I appreciate about his definition of neoliberalism is he points to the fact quite explicitly of how it's an ideology and a principle that in the end argues that it's um, a mechanism to promote human well-being. Right. And it's so interesting, especially when we think about how mindfulness has been framed around this idea of wellness and human well-being. Um, and it's really entrenched in this whole structure, this capitalist structure of mystification, preventing us from really seeing what's going on by going inward and looking at our breath, um, but not really enabling us to have retrospection on structural issues that, that um, are, for many of us, 
restricting the ability um, for people to breathe. I mean, especially in regards to the African American population in the United States, literally restricting the ability for people to breathe. And 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 also very practically in terms of of how it's used in schools. That that as you pointed out in in your writings that that it's it's a focus on individual success and individual. Um, um, skills and individual development, rather than seeing it, um, seeing seeing human growth and development and as an, as an interconnectedness. Yeah, and it's fascinating to me that there is that focus that can be ma- maintained for so long that um, there hasn't been much more critique done on it because uh, mindfulness as a practice that's been. Um, taught for thousands of years and practiced by many Asian cultures for thousands of years has been a collective practice. I mean, people might go off and um, sit um, and practice meditation on their own, but it's always done within this idea that this is a collective practice. Yeah, I think um, one of the examples you use in the chapter that um, I really resonated with, because I I believe I've sort of pointed to... uh, my uh, reservations of Dan Harris's book, Ten uh, Percent Happier, but uh, yeah, some of the remarks I think that he makes uh, are really exemplify in this section of your uh, chapter. It's called Neoliberal Marketing and Racial Invisibility, and uh, yeah, just some of the remarks are <clears throat> I think so blatantly uh, colonialist in their tone and in their substance. Uh, medi- for example, he, Dan Harris says meditation suffers from a towering PR problem. Mm-hmm. And he says if you can get past the cultural baggage, though, yeah. what you'll find is that meditation is simply an exercise for your brain. It's a proven technique for preventing the voice in your head from leading you around by the nose. And and this is a, <clears throat> a familiar trope that we hear is that, uh, yeah, secular mindfulness uh, is superior uh, because it's, it's uh, basically uh, jettisoned uh, the cultural baggage. And uh, to me, uh, I think what you bring up here is um, you even make a point, I think I forgot who exactly it was, a Nautier. Uh, actually, you had a term called baggage Buddhism. Mm-hmm. What Can you say what that is and how that relates to... This critique about uh, this uh, white superiority? Yeah, so the term baggage Buddhism has come to mean and come to kind of imply this type of Buddhism that is brought to the United States from uh, people who have immigrated from Asia and therefore carries, um, in many ways that it's understood, therefore carries with it the idea of it being superstitious, it, it not being necessarily authentic even though it, it's directly from Asia um, and that's not to say that everything from Asia is authentic mm-hmm. um, but there are challenges to authenticity that then become um, rectified or reconciled through the white ownership of Buddhism or mindfulness practice by people like Dan Harris saying well let me tell you what it's really good for what mindfulness should really be um used for and how it should be used and let's get rid of all this PR stuff that um, yeah. that is kind of like damaging to the image, the proper image of what mindfulness should be. And there's this idea the pro- proper image should be one that's based around ideas of science and right. reason and right. rationality. Yeah, I think, well, he, I think he says somewhere too that, uh, you know, I used to think I don't know the exact quote. I used to think of meditation was uh, something that people did in yurts with bearded swamis and and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, think, so, I think we also have to acknowledge that that he may be taking his his hint from from the MBSR people, right? They they mm-hmm. they were very committed to, as Ron said, jettisoning the uh, you know the, the the Buddhist trappings and making it scientifically valid. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting how through MBSR there's this attempt to make it universal, the Buddhist teachings universal by hiding the fact. Um, or kind of like um, making more subtle the fact that it does come from a Buddhist framework Um, and just the hubris of being able to claim that that 
you have the authority to make this universal and, and not recognize that the Buddha Dharma has always been universal. It's right. always <clears throat> already been universal. Um, it's <clears throat> shocking to me. That's a very good point. And uh, I actually pulled up a few other uh, <clears throat> pieces that have been uh, in circulation, um, I think, that amplify and illustrate what you're saying. Uh, about a year or so ago, the Buddha Dharma magazine <clears throat> actually had a special issue called the Mindfulness Movement, What Does It Mean for mm. Buddhism? <clears throat> mm. And um, there's one particular remark that was made by uh, one of the interviewees that uh, really rubbed me the wrong way. And if you don't mind, I want to read it real quick and see what you think. Yeah, so this, this person says, I think these critiques, and I think she's referring to the critiques we've been making <laughs> and other friends of ours, but I think these crit critiques come from Buddhist fundamentalists. I mean, if you really want to see watered-down Buddhism, travel to the beautiful Zen temples of Korea, a country where Buddhism is still alive and well, and you'll see all the ladies in the temples working their malas, chatting about their kids, sometimes chucking peas. The temples are very much village and urban gathering places. How many people are deeply practicing? I don't know, but I think in any center, it's always the minority who are doing what died in the world Buddhists would recognize as pure practice. So that's that's something that really rubbed me the wrong way when I read that. Mm, that yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, us us white Buddhists over here, we we've got the real Buddhism. We've got the uh, the pure practice, the universal Dharma. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and then another uh, in religious dispatches, uh, there was an interview with uh, Chade Meng Tan, who is uh, the former uh, head of uh, Google's mindfulness program. And so the interviewer says, "How did your opinion of Buddhism change when you came to the United States?" And he says, well, I started learning Vipassana. Everything changed. I became a real Buddhist. Mm. The Dharma you see in America is pure, as opposed to Asian Buddhism, in which you go to a temple and there's nothing else. I have credibility in saying that because I've seen both sides. Not that American Buddhism is free of problems, but it's the purest Buddhism. Of course, if you go to a real Zen master in Japan, that's even purer. It's absolutely essential to remember the source of the teachings. Um, so I think this is sort of getting at what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's interesting with that last quote because I feel like um, one of the ways that secular mindfulness has been able to um, maintain this kind of um, centrality in mainstream American culture is through establishing celebrity teachers um, and um, most of the celebrity teachers have been white, but sometimes you will have people of color, celebrity teachers, who um, they can only, and this is for the white and the POC um, celebrity teachers, um, who particularly the ones who kind of disavow or um, disregard the, the um, validity of Asian Buddhist practices and Asian American Buddhist practices. Yeah. Um, you can only really establish yourself as a standout teacher, a celebrity teacher, if you... Uh, align yourself with the white Buddhist framework. Um, yeah, that's a good within point. the Asian, yeah, within the Asian American and Asian Buddhist traditions, they have already a whole set of teachers, and and they wouldn't stand out in the same way. They wouldn't have the same star appeal in the same way. So, um, in many regards, to align yourself with white Buddhism um, is the way to kind of make a name for yourself. Well, that's a very interesting observation. I think that uh, <clears throat> I think you're pointing to this this whole cultural translation of, of Buddhism in the West, which is very messy. Uh, but what we haven't really paid much attention to is the imbalances of power and uh, just how West Western centric uh, our conceptions are. Which, uh, to some degree, I you know I can understand that because. Uh, as, Buddhist, uh, as Buddhism uh, moves to the West, it does have to, uh, uh, you know, inflect, uh, you know, Westernized uh, uh, sensibilities. But uh, I think that's very different than what you're saying, is that we have imbalances of power going on here, which are mystified. They're, they're, uh, they're covered over uh, by these other sort of yeah. rhetorics. Yeah. But, but let, let me follow up a bit on 
on that point, I mean, um, one, one of the things that Fooney writes about is, is uh, what I was very intrigued with is um, a t- the 12-fold social path. Is that, I mean, that is that, you know, where is that coming from? <laughs> is that, uh, is that, is that from Asian Buddhism or is it kind of a more Western version? Um, in terms of, you know, we, you mentioned right, like right education and a few other, a few other um, mm-hmm. paths. Um, before I answer that question, I want to just be very clear about something because I think that there's a way in which my statements have been read um, in the different pieces that have come out. Um, and also, uh, it can be very easily read by people who are coming from a different perspective that I'm arguing that Asian and Asian American Buddhist practices are the most authentic and pure and perfect forms. And I am by no means making that argument because right. um, Buddhist practices within these traditions can be very problematic. Um, and I've seen that from my own participation in different sanghas, that there are still a lot of issues that need to be um, confronted with. So I'm not making that argument. And I'm not um, making the argument that um, the Buddhism that has uh, taken shape in the United States is not an authentic form. I think that there's something very unique about it, and there's something that is really special that it's contributing. Um, and I also, I think any practitioner needs to recognize that Buddhism only develops through the different shapes that it takes within different cultural contexts, and that's that's what Buddhist practice is. It's evolved in everywhere that it's gone to. So that the fact that it would evolve in the United States. It's not something that's um, an indicator that it's no longer authentic at all. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, absolutely, and and <clears throat> I think what uh, the issues that uh, that we struggle with uh, is that uh, when the uh, power imbalances are such that uh, the dominant paradigm becomes a sort of a uh, uh, psychotherapeutic uh, biomedical. Uh, paradigm of how mindfulness is situated, uh, it automatically, by doing it that way, uh, you're delimiting or you're, you're basically uh, uh, bracketing uh, questions of, uh, of, uh, of context, questions of uh, power, questions of, uh, you know, who, like you said, who has the authority to, to just declare that this is the universal dharma? Uh, mm-hmm. And what yeah. does that mean? I mean, uh, is it just uh, you know uh, individual well-being? Uh, so yeah, I think with the cultural translation process is uh, <clears throat> by no means. I think uh, I don't think we're. I, I think one of the problems I have with the mindfulness movement is that they've declared victory. That yeah, Buddhism. We've, we're here. We've done it. Uh, Buddhism is now in the West. We we'll look at the mindfulness phenomena. Uh, we've done it. We've translated it. It's it's uh, flourishing. And, and I, th- I think that what I just appreciate Funi's statement also because one of the kind of, um, we think, specious arguments are, that are made against those of us who, who are critical is that is that, well, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to go back to some pure traditional form of Buddhism? Right. Um, I, I think a lot of people have pigeonholed uh, our critiques saying, uh-huh. well, you're just Buddhist fundamentalists who yeah. are advocating a return to authentic, you know, Buddhist practice as it's contextualized within the Asian tradition. One hundred percent. But, you know, what I find an, uh, an irony to that, because it, a lot of the secular people are saying we found the, the um, authentic Buddhism because we've, yeah. we've we've rid it of cultural baggage. Right. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of exactly. quite ironic in a way. Yeah, it's it's really ironic. And I think that um, the the root of the issue is this insistence on maintaining a sort of structural delusion. Structural delusion. Wow, that's a great term. Can you amplify mm-hmm. that? Yeah, um, so it's it's different than just the delusion that we think about in terms of Buddhist practice. For, so for people in the Buddhist community who identify as practitioners, um, we understand delusion as like kind of a, a way of not understanding the reality of the world um, and the way that we interbe, as Thich Nhat Hanh might say, um, and and the wisdom of non-duali- uh, non-duality. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also a way that I think people... Are, 
when they're pushed to think about how they might be delusional in the way they view, view society and the way that society has been constructed, they're really not willing to go there. So, so there's kind of um, a strong attachment um, and white fragility, especially around questioning um, if people really have a true understanding of the structures that maintain our society um, and letting go of that attachment, I think, makes people really uncomfortable in a way that um, that their Buddhist practice, they're not willing to use their Buddhist practice to go there and kind of examine. Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, that's probably what's uh, so unique, too, about the East Bay, East Bay Meditation Center. You, you've been involved with them as well, haven't you? Yeah, mostly as somebody who has just gone to practice there um, uh, and and because of my work with the Buddhist Peace Fellowship, there's a close partnership with EBMC. And, and uh, so I know some of the teachers there. And I've been been very um, grateful to have learned important teachings from those teachers and from the place EBMC. It's such a, a gem of a place. Yes, yeah. I, I remember we were together on a panel there uh, a couple summers back. And it was, uh, yeah. it was, it was such a pleasure mm-hmm. to, to be uh, the, uh, in that group. Bush, Bush, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe we could uh, bring up your most recent uh, publication, uh, which came out in Lion's Roar. Uh, the title was We've Been Here All Along, <clears throat> which came out on November 21st in Lion's Roar. Uh, what prompted you to write that? And uh, maybe tell us a little bit about it. I know that uh, when it first came out, that uh, there were some uh, interesting responses to the editor, which... Uh, probably just uh, reveal and uh, illustrate the very points that you just made about white fragility. Yeah. Um, so what prompted me to write that piece was that it had been something that had been on my mind for a very long time. I kind of live with these questions, and, and that's, I think, one of the reasons why um, the pieces that I write tend to have like elements of this and that, because I've been living with these questions for a long time. Um, and I think the conditions were just right um, for that Lions Roar piece to come out in the way that it did. Um, and one of the things, an element of that condition was not just that I had been thinking about the, the place of Asian Americans um, um, and Asian Buddhists in American Buddhism and the fact that the place has been one that's pushed off into the margins, but that I had come across an old post on um, Arun Likati's Angry Asian Buddhist, in which she was talking about this person that I didn't know of, um, Reverend uh, Neo Imamura. And he had talked about, um, Arun was talking about the tricycle incident, the letter that Reverend Imamura wrote in response to the editor of Tricycle. At that time, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, and it was an older piece, as I mentioned, um, but I just, I came across it um, less than a year ago, I think, and I was just filled with emotion seeing that letter because I didn't know. And I felt like, wow, for somebody who's a board member of BPF and who's interested in these issues, how did I not know of Reverend Imamura? Um, And it was just a clarifying moment of this is how white supremacy works. I didn't know of this person who I consider an elder in my community um, as an Asian American Buddhist um, and somebody who has been so, his family has been so fundamental and paramount to the development of American Buddhism. I didn't know of his existence and I didn't know of their work. Um, A very untold history, a very hidden history. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And and there were ways in which Reverend Imamura tried to make this history known, but he was kind of shut down. And um, it's an aspect of how white supremacy works that, that I don't think people were aware of. Um, and I think that most people aren't aware that it actually does happen to Asian Americans because there's this perception that we are doing fine. We're almost like white people, as many people like to um, point out um, wrongly, I would say. Um, and there's this myth um, that we're model minorities. And so the fact that Asian Americans, our development within the United States has been structured by white supremacy is something that it's hard for many people to understand. Um, but to me, this was a pivotal moment. So I have much gratitude for Arun Lakati and the work that he's done um, and that post. Um, and it led me to actually being able to talk with Reverend Imamura and having a, a number of email exchanges with him. 
um, in which I got to know his story. There's so much backstory in the creation of that Buddha Dharma article that didn't go into the actual words of the article, but I needed to have a relationship with him first in order to be able to, um, mm-hmm. to talk about some of these issues. And uh, his letter has never been fully published um, oh. in its entirety. And so uh, Buddhist Peace Fellowship, we're happy to be able to do that in the upcoming month. To, to publish his entire letter, letter without edits. Yeah, I think that would be valuable to do that. Um, I think uh, your article is very, I mean, it comes across very personal. It comes across very, very mm-hmm. sincere. Yes. And uh, you even start with a very colorful story of uh, Masumi Kimura, a, ten, a 10-year-old boy who, who uh, was observing his father uh, that were uh, the FBI... Uh, uh, we're pounding on on on, on the door. Uh, can you tell us that story a little bit? Because it's very moving. Oh yeah. First, I need to say that's not my story. That um, that comes from the work of well, it comes from the story of that family of the Kamura family. But it comes from the scholarly work of um, Duncan Williams. And oh, uh, yes. so oh yes, yes, okay. yeah, yeah. I um, am very grateful for the work that he's done around this history. Um, but I thought it was such a moving piece because it really demonstrates the reality of um, Japanese American incarceration. Uh, my partner's family was incarcerated. Um, I have a number of very close friends whose families were incarcerated. And for many people, uh, many Americans and people residing in the U.S., they don't know how real that moment in history was. Right. Um, and many of them don't even know that it happened. Uh, I teach American studies, and many of my students aren't even aware that that happened. Yeah, that's and scary. It, it, yeah, it's. <laughs> would, would, would you say that's? Would you say that's true on the West Coast as well? Because because here it's definitely true. Yeah, I don't understand how it can be true. I mean, yeah, I, <laughs> it happened on the West Coast, but it is true. I, I learned about it. I learned about it as a, as a high school student, but very few people do, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think. I mean, it, it's in my recollection. I think it's in the American history standards at the high school level um, in California, mm-hmm. but um, it's a cursory cursory knowledge that students get, maybe half a page or a page in, in a textbook. Um, it doesn't go into the details of it. And most of the narrative around Japanese American incarceration is this very odd story of something bad happened to us, but we persevered and now we're fine. And um, right. that's, right. that's not, it's much more complex than that. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, that's the story for all of us, for almost all of us. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, Reverend uh, Imamura, Imamura uh, you make the point that it, it was through him, actually, that many of the early uh, <clears throat> beat, uh, uh, beat Zen guys got, got their introduction to Buddhism. Yeah, and, and I think some of them had um, already learned of Buddhism, but, but they definitely did enhance their practice and their knowledge through... Um, the studies that were conducted with Reverend Ivamura's father um, and kind of hosted under um, the hospitality of his father and his mother. Um, yeah, and met- so there's this long legacy of their contributions to not just American Buddhism, but American literature. Yeah, you mentioned Gary Snyder, Jack Kerouac, Alan Watts were among the countless mm-hmm. people who came by uh, mm-hmm. the study groups in Berkeley at the time. So, mm-hmm. um, So what... Was your uh, initial uh, uh, sense when uh, the article came out and there were some uh, uh, contentious uh, letters sent to the editor of Lion's Roar? Um, well, um, before the letter even came out, I remember when I sent the draft over to Tanet, I kind of half expected them to say that, uh, I'm sorry, we can't publish this. Mm-hmm. Um, even though I didn't really think that it was saying anything that was a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought like, well, this is just a fact. Um, but they, it was, it was a really wonderful experience working with Tanet because they never questioned my perspective at all. Um, if anything, they've only been supportive. So when it finally came out, um, there were some positive, uh, feedback, um, there was some positive feedback that I received just from friends, et cetera. Um, but then Tanette wrote me saying that we're going to issue this response to some criticism that we've received. Um, and we just want to give you a heads up. And she showed me um, 
I think she sent me a draft at that point of what they wanted to say um, and and showed me some of the quotes from people who had written in and said that they were upset. Um, and I thought it was so interesting that uh, here is something that I had written explicitly about detailing these types of uh, white feelings and, yeah. and they were happening right. well, I, <laughs> as a response. Yeah. Yeah. So you and, and, were you surprised and, and, or not surprised? <laughs> would, would you say they were very mindful? Um, not really. I mean, I was, I was surprised, not surprised. That feeling yeah. of like, I'm not surprised. Of course, I wouldn't be surprised, but I'm still surprised by how um, uncritical it is. Like that, we're confronting this again. Like it's kind of, I don't know. There has to be a better word for that feeling of surprised but not surprised. Yeah. Um, but. Reverend Imamura, he told me when I when I mentioned that I was interested in writing about this and sharing about his history, he was saying, like, well, be careful because you're going to piss off a lot of people and it happened with him. Um, so I thought, you know, I've been I've been warned and um, I, I wasn't shocked that it happened at all. I was kind of expecting it. But the area that kind of left me feeling disappointed was that I, I wanted more of a concrete, like helpful critique uh -huh. And the comments that were made, they didn't help in moving the conversation anywhere. And maybe I misspoke. Maybe there's something that I left out of my um, understanding. And it would have been helpful if, if someone provided that kind of analysis if they were upset. But I, I didn't get any of that. It was mostly stuff like, um, I think one of the comments was, she ain't no Buddhist, which I thought was so <laughs> fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I think I should just print that out and hang it on my wall in my office. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a badge, no badge of honor. That's a badge yeah. of honor. Yeah, no, they were they're 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 personal. They're personally defensive. I mean, they're not they're, like you said. They're not they're not helpful responses. Yeah. Well, I think you had uh, didn't you have uh, Ajahn Amaro, the Venerable Ajahn Amaro, write a letter in here. Uh, uh, supporting uh, your piece? Yeah, I didn't know that was going to happen. So so when I read the response, um, well, I think Tanette in that email to me, like giving me the heads up that um, people were pissed and she was going to write a response, said something about his support um, and, or that he was going to even write a letter at that point. But I just felt so... Um, uh, there's a sense of gratitude that is complex because because it can be like encompassed within within this gratitude for like um, white recognition that Adan Amaro is this white practitioner in this Asian tradition and he's lending his support. But I like to believe that it was beyond that. Um, but just a sense of gratitude in a way that I finally felt um, that I was moving closer and that we as a community were moving closer to really interbeing beyond the confines of the structural delusion of race and conquest, that, mm -hmm. that he was willing to, of the generosity of his spirit, write something in support of this perspective um, to share that it was meaningful to him. Um, and him being a teacher um, to so many people, a widely recognized teacher, I think that meant a lot for other people who might have been kind of like skittish about receiving my, my perspective. It, probably opened up a pathway for them to consider things in a different light. So I'm very appreciative of that kind of engagement. Yeah, he's wonderful. He came to our conference uh, here a few years back, and uh, he's you know very strongly uh, steeped in, in, in writing about uh, Buddhist ethics, too. So I, mm -hmm. I, I, was, I was very happy to see that. Yeah. Um, one, yeah. Of the, one of the points you make towards the end of this article, um, which I, I thought probably would lead to maybe several other articles, just this one paragraph. Maybe, you're all, maybe you are uh, already thinking about that. But it's the line where you say everyone uh, can benefit from reflecting on cultural appropriation as a way to deepen our Buddhist practice. And we can do this by using the five precepts as a guide. I thought that was beautiful. And uh, I think that goes back to what you're saying is that uh, – there's this uh, uh, reluctance or resistance or uh, avoidance of, of, of bringing in, uh, you know, these issues as, as a way of, uh, you know, uh, Buddhist practice. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that 
is part of my um, observing mindfulness as it's playing out in American society from the perspe- perspective of a scholar is to also really be intentional in thinking from the perspective of Buddhism as a decol- decolonial knowledge space. And so a lot of the methodology that went into writing um, the book chapter and this piece and the other pieces that I'm working on is to actually be fully engaged um, as much as I can um, as a lay practitioner in the Buddhist practice and being taught by uh, by people who are teachers in my tradition. And in my case, that means a monastic tradition. So when I was writing this piece, it was framed around the context of me going to Dharma talks all the time um, and practicing within a Sangha um, and listening to um, a teacher, an abbess, detail kind of the system of Buddhism um, in a way that's really different from mainstream secular mindfulness and um, where you kind of just pick and choose, as I mentioned, but really detailing the system. And so Tanette was saying that, you know, um, be sure in this Buddha Dharma piece that it's not just academic. And I want to to have a, an offering, a way for people to continue to practice and not just come across as if it's a piece of criticism, um, yeah. but a way for people to move forward. And so it's thinking back to the teachings from the abbess and around the precepts and what we can do around that. Um, it just be- became clear to me that it's it's obvious that there's a way that we can, can, can continue to practice um, uh, the Buddhist wisdom with this newer social wisdom or trying to integrate this uh, social awareness of of what's been happening in regards to race and uh, white supremacy in the United States. No, I think, um, I think that was a great uh, way of hooking the article at the end by doing that. It's not just a, uh, a critical piece. It, it, uh, you, you succeeded. I, I, I think that uh, uh, you even bring up uh, radical rebirth as uh, something that's being uh, talked about at the Buddhist uh, Peace Fellowship. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you say just a few words? Is that related to what you're talking about? Um, yeah, somewhat. I mean, so radical rebirth first are a set of principles that um, the new direction of BPF, since the co-directors, a fabulous co-directors, Don Haney and Katie Lonk, yes, um, have fabulous. stepped in. <laughs> and so they've detailed that. I think uh, if you go to BPF, um, org and then you just search for radical rebirth, uh-huh. it'll... Pull, there'll be a post that has all of the 10 principles. Oh, um, maybe we'll put a link to that too on the show. Yeah, that show would notes. be, that would be wonderful. Um, I know that they would appreciate that. Um, so it kind of redirects the, uh, or encourages people to incorporate these social dimensions of our lived reality into our Buddhist practice. Um, and, encourages people to think about making those connections internally, but also in the way that we participate and function in the world. Yes, that's great. That's definitely part of the socially engaged uh, Buddhist uh, initiative that I think BPF has been <laughs> probably the, the the leader. I mean, it started the whole, practically started the socially engaged Buddhist movement. Yeah. Yeah. Is it what, well, 20, 20 or 25 years has BPF been around? Um, I should know that. <laughs> we'll, we'll look that up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, maybe uh, this was a great interview, uh, Funi. We're so you happy. Know, I, that, oh, do you have another question? I just want to, yeah, I just want to touch it. And we, we, we obviously won't have time really to get into it or let alone solve this issue. I just want to touch on a kind of a thorny issue that we, that we've kind of brought up earlier. Um, I, I think that I think that we are really exploring in some ways the, the, the border of, of Buddhism and secular secular practices, secular mindfulness. Um, I mean, clearly what, what a lot of we've been talking about today is is, is, a, is a way how to be, in a way, I, well, I, I, there's not good words for how to be a better Buddhist. I mean, how to, how to really, within, within the tradition, um, really, really fulfill many things. Mm. And, and, and I also think that Buddhism has much to offer to 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 the West, to the, the secular world, and I think we've been talking about that as well. And I think the thorn, one of the thorny issues that I certainly haven't I think think about too. I live with it, and I haven't th- figured out a lot of it is in terms of in ter- going back to school. I mean, we, we you know Ron and I have seen like with with uh, Candy Gunther Brown the whole issue of 
of Buddhism as a Trojan horse and people are sort of seeing it as, as smuggling in, in, in this notion of Buddhist values into schools. And if, and if that becomes, if there's a backlash to that and with, or a reasonable notion of separation of, of church and state, I mean, how, you know, a larger question that, that you know, to, just, to, just to, to, to sit with is really how, how do we bring some of these values and, and practices, you know, into, into a public setting, into public schools? Um, and, and, you know, if there's a, if there is a restriction in terms of, well, that's, you know, that's Buddhism or you can't really call it that or whatever. Um, and it's just something that I, that I wrestle with, uh, myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's a great point to bring up. And one of the ways that I thought about this is that, um, I think the, the promise of being able to talk about Buddhist practice in schools is, can, um, only be made possible, I think, or only realized to its full potential when we can talk about other practices within the school as well. So if we can talk about um, practices from the Muslim tradition, um, practices from indigenous American traditions, I mean, the separation of, of church and state within the schools is a delicate issue, but it also is one that still prioritizes Christianity. Um, I mean, and there's a way that we're deluded to that fact. Um, and we think that we're neutral as an American society by having this separation of church and state, but the curriculum in the school is still overwhelmingly Christian. Um, and I think that in order to change that or to, to have a possibility of introducing some of these um, Buddhist wisdoms as something that could be helpful for those students who might be interested, um, we have to look at educational change. That's not just a surface level restructuring or like integrating this new reform that costs millions of dollars here and there, but really re-understanding what it means to have a school system and what it is that we're doing through education. And I think that we do need to think about what we're taking away from students. I mean, it's very limited, limiting for a student in the United States to not know about different religious traditions. And I think that there is a way that we can teach them all um, that, that doesn't necessarily advocate for the supremacy of one or the, the moral superiority of one versus another. And I think um, that comes closer to operating within what I like to think about and imagine as a decolonial way of understanding knowledge. Yeah, that's great. And, and I think it also complements what, what you had raised in some of your writings about th that we have to insist on asking the question, what is the purpose of education? What, 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 you know, what do we stand for? What, what are our values? Mm -hmm. It's not just uh, neoliberal, you know, to get a better job, to succeed in the market and so on. It's, it has to do with 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 much much deeper values that 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 are definitely uh, the, the, a number of these you could you, interspiritual or, or a number of denominations or religions can can bring to bear on that. Yeah, and and the importance of what schools are for. I mean, that's such a, a critical question because when we cut things out from school and only focus on um, what is important, the technical skills for a neoliberal global society, then we get we get the lack of a criticalness that enables someone like Trump to be yeah, president elect. We yep. end yep. up with Trump. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe on that, and we can end on. Well, I don't want to end on a Trump note, but <laughs> no. uh, <laughs> I think we do have to bring the interview, interview to a close. But it's been wonderful uh, talking with you, Funi, and uh, yeah. we will uh, post uh, links to your articles on our on our show notes. So, so we've been speaking with Funi Sue. Thank you so much, Funi. Thank you so much. I really appreciate having this time to chat with you, too. Thank you. Okay, yeah. this has been the Mindful Cranks. We've been speaking with Dr. Funi Sue, and we'll be back.